Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of The Invention of Sound by Chuck Palahniuk. So I picked this up from a charity shop, beautiful little hardback edition. I uh, really enjoyed the storyline to this one, so I'm actually going to be giving this to my other half, because um, she said she, she thought it sounded interesting. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. I will say this reminded me in some ways of American Psycho, or uh, Fight Club, it's got, well, I mean, Paul and it wrote Fight Club, so maybe that's why. But it has that kind of vibe to it, you know? So, the blurb. Dane reads. Chuck Paulinick returns with the chilling tale of a father in search of his daughter, a young woman with a secret, and a malicious recording that can make the whole world scream at the exact same time. Private detective Foster Gates is a father in search of his missing daughter, and sound engineer Mitzi harbors a secret that may help him solve the case. It's Mitzi's job to create the dubbed screams used in horror films and action movies. She's the best at what she does. But what no one in Hollywood knows is the screams Mitzi produces are harvested from the real, horror-filled, blood-chilling screams of people in their death throes, a technique first employed by Mitzi's father, and one she continues on in his memory. A deeply conflicted serial killer, compelled beyond her understanding to honour her father's chilling legacy. Soon, Foster finds himself on Mitzi's trail, and in pursuit of her dark art, Mitzi realises she's created the perfect scream, one that compels anyone who hears it to mirror the sound as long as they listen to it. A highly contagious seismic event with the potential to bring the country to its knees. So, let's go through and check out some tabby tabs. All right, so a couple of interesting paragraphs I want to read out to you here. And funnily enough, um, Shay and I, my girlfriend and I, we watched the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And someone in that got stabbed in the stomach and died instantly. And, and I re um, referred to this line because I was reading this book at the time. Um, but the first bit is interesting. It's about housekeepers. It was the housekeeper, Mitzi knew, who'd found Sharon Tate butchered. It was the housekeeper who'd found Marilyn Monroe cold and naked. It occurred to Mitzi that stumbling across your pregnant boss stabbed to death must be among the worst ways to find yourself out of a job. Stabbing, Mitzi could write a book about. For example, why some killers kept stabbing for so long. Only the first thrust is intended to inflict pain. The subsequent 20, 30, 40 stab wounds are to resolve the suffering. It takes as little as one stab or slash to trigger the screaming and bleeding. But so many more are required to make them stop. And I just thought this was quite interesting. And I assume this is true as well, or at least the superstition. In olden times, Mitzi knew, no one wanted to curse a tree. So when a hanging took place, people leaned a ladder against a wall and tied a rope to the highest rung. The condemned would stand atop a chair or sit astride a horse. As the chair toppled or the horse bolted, a noose hanging in the area below the ladder did the trick. That gave birth to the fear of walking beneath ladders, because a person never knew. The spirit or spirits of highwaymen or cutthroats might still haunt the space where they'd been executed. Spirits of the evil crowded the earth to avoid their destiny in hell. The dead suffered no hangovers, she hoped. Jeez, I hope. So I just thought this was cool. We're talking here again about the sound effects we see in films. Uh, people, Mitzi asked herself, what do they know? They think they know the sound of a bone breaking when all they know is celery. Frozen celery wrapped in chamois and snapped in half. How they think a school sounds when someone jumps off a skyscraper and slams headfirst on the sidewalk. That's just a double layer of soda crackers glued to a watermelon and smacked with a baseball bat. Your average moviegoer thought all knives made the same noise going in. The poor innocents wouldn't know the true sound of arterial spray until it was their own head-on car accident. And so here's kind of how Mitzi justifies her work. So, for a while Mitzi had called her work politics. To her mind, women had never been allowed to kill, not unless they were threatened. Women could never kill for the sheer pleasure, and they could never kill another woman. Despite all the fuss about universal childcare and income inequality, killing was the real measure of a woman's progress. As the thrill of that first recording session had ebbed, Mitzi told herself that collecting screams amounted to a political act. It constituted the ultimate power. To her mind, it amounted to last wave feminism. Interesting stuff. They talk about the Wilhelm scream, so M Mitzi says, You've heard it. It was a man's scream first recorded in 1951 for a film titled Distant Drums. In one scene, soldiers wade through an alligator infested swamp, hence the scream's formal title. Man getting bit by alligator and he screamed. Since it was created, the Wilhelm scream has been used in more than 400 features, as well as countless television projects and video games. And she talks about how she needs her victims to be fully awake because there's going to be no chance for a second take. So I just thought this was interesting, this couple of paragraphs here. Mitzi could anticipate how a stranger would scream. She'd done this work so long and so often. In airport, she'd spy someone. In the supermarket, she knew who would scream for his mother and who would only scream. Experience, at least hers, showed that no one screamed for God. Fat or thin, black or white or Asian, men or women, young or old, she knew how their final moments on earth would sound. On sight, she knew whether a stranger at the library would let loose with a full-throated giving up compared to a teeth-gritting, stubborn, grunting death. Or the worst the mewling of a leaky balloon, something almost laughable like a dog's squeak toy. 
actual people actually died that way a few okay so this I just thought was pretty amusing I like this kind of writing where it's just brutally sort of honest and visceral Jimmy's skin smelled like paint so much so that when she'd wrap her hand around his dick and jerk it up and down like shaking a can of spray paint she'd half expect to hear something rattle inside ketoacidosis the smell probably was his body was that kind of lean but Mitzi suspected years of vandalism had seeped into his pores, giving him body odour like so much late night graffiti. We learn that dogs have laugh tracks, and we get this pretty cool little passage here. Yawning and laughter, she went on to explain, are contagious because they were the proto-human's method for regulating the mood of their group or tribe. Jimmy's eyes drifted closed. He appeared to be slipping back into dreams. A major trait of psychopaths, she explained, is that they don't yawn when people around them yawn. Psychopaths don't feel empathy. They lack the mirror neurons. Just a cool little thing here about, I guess, the uh, sexism and whatnot. Um, what's the word? Fucking not masochism. Chauvinism uh, that, that kind of plagues Hollywood. Since the dawn of films when young women had been tied to railroad tracks and tied to logs sent into huge sawmill blades, Hollywood had never lacked new ways to take pretty girls apart. And uh, he, so he's at a, like a comic con, basically, and we get... The place was a target-rich environment for any paedophile. Tens of thousands of children broke away from their parents and milled in awestruck wonder at the sight of their cartoon heroes. Everywhere, exits linked the halls to the outside world. Any pervert in a teddy bear ghetto could take his victim by the little hand and spirit her away without notice. We get references to Amy Semple McPherson and Agatha Christie um, because this film starlet wants to fake her own kidnapping because she thinks it will be like good publicity. And so this starlet, it says, um, first they got loaded, a little loaded, but for a long time on the bottle of rum she brought back after fixing the street door so it wouldn't attract attention. Rum because she liked the sweetness, like high school parties she'd never attended because she'd been too busy playing the role of a teenage slattern to actually slattern around. Playing a sex part had kept her a virgin until her first marriage. We get a reference to Munchausen syndrome and Munchausen by pop proxy in which like um, parents basically convince themselves that, and, and their child that their child is ill. Um, it's like a form of mental illness. Very interesting but also very sad. So he talks about uh, the skywalks in the Kansas City Hyatt. So crowded with dancers in 1981, so many dancers doing the Lindy Hop in synchronized time, that the sky bridges had crumbled, killing 114. And I believe I watched an episode of the show Seconds from Disaster about that. And Mitzi is using a Shaw Vocal SM57, um, which I have an SM58, um, which I use for, yeah, vocal. And just this was really cool as well. Um, Paul Linux clearly done a lot of research into the way microphones work. So he writes, uh, she described how crooning had replaced more traditional singing in the 1920s. At the time, carbon would build up in microphones and broadcasters needed to shut off each mic occasionally and strike it with a small hammer to clear that build up. The softer, more prolonged notes sung by crooners created less carbon build up. Cornets replaced trumpets for the same reason. In short, people could only listen to what microphones could pick up. Technology dictated fashions in music. And I just think that's really cool. But overall, the invention, of, the invention of sound by Chuck Paul and a really interesting reader. Again, I liked all this stuff about how the vocal mics worked. I love the concept of the Foley artist. I love how brutal and visceral it was as well. Overall, I can't really fault it. I gave this a very strong 4.5 out of 5. I guess the ending got a little confusing and convoluted. So that would be my only criticism I could really level at it. But even then, I did still enjoy reading it. I'm going to give it to my girlfriend because I think she'll like it. 4.5 out of 5, the invention of sound, Chuck Paul and it. Get it in you. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Invention of Sound by Chuck Paul, and as always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read this, wait, let me know in the comments what you thought of this video, if you've read this book, or whatever it is, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video, thanks a lot, bye bye.